know, for the last three weeks, we've just gone through the scriptures and talked about the reality of hell. Last week, uh, we went over to Luke chapter 16 and, and uh, looked at the uh, story that Jesus told about a man that actually existed, two men. Uh, one was uh, just called, the Bible calls him uh, a rich man, the rich man. Uh, The Latin translation of the Bible calls his name Dives. So maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. And then there was a poor man named Lazarus. And both of them died. One went to to, uh, uh, to a a good place awaiting heaven. And the other one found himself in the flames of hell. And then last week, we ended last week with quite a riveting video of Kenneth Hagin, who at 16 years of age, because he had a... A, um, a, a deformed heart and an incurable blood condition began to die at 16 years of age and literally three times in one day he died, his heart stopped, his spirit left his body and he had a personal experience and we listened to that last week. He went down into the darkness, the dark foreboding place just before he was thrown into the gates of hell, a voice spoke and he came back up and uh, I heard him minister that any number of times when I lived in Tulsa in the uh, 1980s and it was quite a riveting time to hear him talk about that experience and always had a big crowd of people that came to Jesus when he shared that and it was often at one of his seminars. How many know hell is a very real place? So we've been talking about that. Today, I want to talk about what Jesus did to deliver us from hell. And you know, we ought to be extremely grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. How many hear me? We sing about it today. Today, really simply, may not take a long time. I just want to talk about four things to understand about what Jesus did for you. How many know, number one, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. In fact, 1 John 3, 8 says this, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy, or other translations bear, undo the works of the devil. Well, um, what are the works of the devil? That's obviously the first question I have. What in the world did the devil do that Jesus felt like his mission in life was to undo or destroy his works? Well, Jesus lets us in on that in John chapter 10. He said this, verse 10, the thief does not come. So he calls Satan a thief. That is, he has robbed us of what God expected us to experience uh, being born into the, on this planet. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Well, what in the world did Satan steal from us? Well, he stole our relationship with God. And when he, when the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, uh, were tempted by Satan and yielded to him, uh, Satan stole their relationship with God. God would come down and fellowship with them. And God had envisioned the father and the family of, and the, his family on earth. He envisioned us walking with him, bearing children, having wonderful families, and him coming uh, down among the people he created on earth just to pal around, just to fellowship, just to enjoy life with us. Well, Satan stole that. The thief comes to steal. He also comes to kill. Well, what did Satan kill? Well, you know, we died spiritually when Adam and Eve sinned. We died. And all of us, there's not a spark of divinity. I've preached on this so much. There's not a spark of divinity that education will just kind of, you know, fan into a big flame of wonderfulness. No, the Bible says we're deceitful above all things and desperately wicked at heart. How many know it's true? And so what did Satan do? He comes to steal. He comes to kill. He, he killed us spiritually in that spiritual death came upon all of us. And the Bible reveals that all of us died spiritually because of what Adam and Eve did in disobeying God. We inherit that innate sin and we are sinners at heart. That's the reason all of us. We love, I love my children, I love my grandchildren, but you better discipline them because at the core of, of sin is self-centeredness. How many hear that? Yeah. So if you're a parent, you don't discipline your children, how many know you got trouble coming? Because the heart is wicked. Satan comes to steal, he comes to kill, not only spiritually, we die physically as a result of, uh, of Satan coming and doing what he did. He also stole our physical life. God gave our physical bodies the properties of constant renewal. Physiologists tell us that perhaps every seven to 11 years, all of the cells of our bodies are replaced with the exception of our, 
of our brain cells and the, and the uh, uh, neurosystem there. But uh, nonetheless, perhaps that's, uh, that's because God originally created us to never die. Death as a result of sin. The soul that sins will die. And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's the reason when Jesus comes back at the rapture of the church, aren't you glad one day you're going to get a glorified body that was like his when he raised from the dead? That's pretty exciting. God created us to live in a human body for eternity and we will because Jesus came to restore. Jesus came to destroy Satan's work. Jesus came to redeem us. Aren't you glad? So the thief comes to steal. He comes to kill. And the third part of that killing, and I mentioned this uh, some weeks ago, is the second death. Any person that leaves this life without Christ, any person that leaves this life without faith in Jesus, the Bible says will experience not just the first death, which is spiritual, spiritual death and not just physical death but he'll also experience what the Bible calls the second death. The second death is eternal separation from God and being placed in a, an eternal penitentiary of the spirit realm called the lake of fire. That's a horrible place. You never get out and it's a place of unending torment, unending, unending, uh, just terribleness. That is the second death, eternal separation from God. The thief comes to steal, he comes to kill, and then he comes to destroy. How many know God created this earth to be a pristine environment where we could enjoy life every single day, but because of what Adam and Eve chose to do, (coughs) excuse me, they chose to yield to Satan's temptations. How many know there's a curse that was placed on the earth and, and God had to say to Adam as much as he loved him and to Eve as much as he loved her, by the sweat of your brow, you will earn your bread. Instead of all these wonderful fruits and things that you see in the garden, now briars and now weeds, they will grow. You'll have to till the ground if you're ever gonna make it because now because of sin, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. How many are glad that Jesus comes that we might have life and have it in abundance? Hebrews 2 says this, inasmuch then as the children has partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, shared the same, that is flesh and blood, that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and then Hebrews 2.15 says, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus came, lived in a human body just like we do, faced every temptation that we face. So look at what God did. He loved us so much. He had such a grand scheme planned for this planet. And when Satan came, that plan was thwarted. It was hindered. But look at what God did. Even before we were created, God envisioned a plan where the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, would come and incarnate in a human body and grow up just like every young person would grow up and learn just like every young person would learn. And not only that, but would face every temptation to sin that we face, but instead of yielding to it, resisted it. He resisted the temptation to lie. He resisted the temptations to steal. He resisted the temptations to gossip and to to slur someone's character. He He resisted lust. He resisted pride. And he did the will of God. Although he was tempted to sin every way we are, how many know he never sinned? The Bible says... And he went through life and faced every single temptation that we face. He did it successfully. And then the Bible says the soul that sins will die. Jesus many times during his ministry, uh, one time they took him to the edge of a hill, uh, a big cliff, cliff, and they were going to throw him off. And the Bible says he just turned around and they just moved out of the way for some unusual reason. Why? Jesus could not die until he was made to be sinned. The soul that sins will die. Jesus lived his entire life, 30, a little over 33 years, uh, lived perfectly, lived sinlessly. And then when he had done everything that the Father had called him to do in this life, he said, Father, it's time. The Father said, Jesus, it's time. And he willingly gave up his life for us. The Bible says, him who knew no sin, we'll see it in a minute, was made to become our sin. And when, G- and Jesus, when Jesus died, it didn't die for himself. 
How many know he died for us? He died in our stead, in our place, and he took the sin penalty that we should suffer. And he did it on purpose so we wouldn't have to endure our own sin penalty. And then when he died, he didn't go immediately to heaven. We're going to see it today. He went to the place that we could, should go. And he suffered the sin penalty that we should suffer. That is, Jesus went to hell. And he stayed there until God was satisfied that our personal sin debt was paid. We're going to examine it today. Then when God was satisfied that judicially and legally our sin debt was paid the Holy Spirit came on Jesus in hell he was resurrected from that spiritual death that he assumed because of us and the Bible says he was raised from the dead Jesus said I'm he that was dead but now I'm alive forevermore and I have some keys in my hand I have the keys of hell I have the keys of death aren't you glad that Jesus broke the chains of sin he he also paid the penalty for our sin judgment for us and when Jesus was raised from the dead he got back in a glorified body signifying that if we make Jesus Lord one day the time will come when he comes back in his second coming that just as he was raised from the dead and got a brand new body one day we'll get one now that's exciting that gives you hope for your future aren't you glad your body's just not going to stay in a grave for eternity no one day that body will come out of that grave just like Jesus did then Jesus appeared to his disciples for for 40 days and then after that he was in Jerusalem he was on the Mount of Olives and he said guys I've got to go somewhere and he ascended up to heaven he was seated at the right hand of the father and the Bible says he ever lives to pray for you and me now that's the gospel in essence Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil how many are glad about that Romans 5 17 says this for if by one man's offense who is that that's Adam death reigned through the one that is through Adam much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ Jesus came to restore everything that Adam and Eve lost when they sinned and even give us more in return aren't you glad about that second thing we need to know today four things that Jesus did for us number two because of God's holiness every person faces judgment at death because of his holiness and most of our world don't understand the reason that we as Christians preach salvation we preach the Lord Jesus they don't understand and they think it's exclusive for Jesus to say I am the way I am the truth I am the life no man comes to the father except through me in weeks past we've examined the fact that no human works are good enough to gain access to heaven for us people who have sinned How many understand it's not works of righteousness that we have done, but it's by his mercy he saved us. Aren't you glad? Well, it's Jesus that did that for us. And because of God's holiness, we can't, every person faces judgment at death. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27 is clear. And just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, there is no way to get around that. At death... (laughs) Judiciously, we have to deal with what we have done in our life. One thing that we need to understand about God is that he loves us, but he's also pure. He's also holy. How many understand that? And the reason that we can't go to heaven when we die, even though we're lovely people, most Americans, again, as I've mentioned, think they're going to heaven when they die. The reason we can't go without Christ is because we're impure. And God is pure. Listen to Revelation 21, 27. But there shall by no means enter uh, it anything that devours. Speaking of the new Jerusalem that will actually suspend from heaven one day between heaven and earth. In eternity, how many know we're not just going to be in heaven. We're going to be in heaven and on earth. And there's a new heavens and a new earth. And the Bible in speaking of that says, but there shall by no means enter God's kingdom anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Why is that? Because God's presence 
is holy. In fact, I've mentioned this so many times. Revelation chapter 4, the angels are before the throne of God. And John on the Isle of Patmos saw, saw the throne of God and saw, saw the angels around the throne of God. And they were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The Greek actually says it nine times, uh, eight, uh, three times each for each word holy. Uh, holy, 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 holy. He's holy. He's pure. That means he's sinless. And nothing that is sinful can enter the presence of God. And that's what most people don't understand. God loves us, but God loves us. He's also holy, and sinful things can't get near him. They would be completely annihilated, completely obliterated by his presence. I was reminding a I'm reminded as I was praying this morning of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah was praying. He saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple and the presence of God came. And when the presence of God came to Isaiah, the first thing he said is, I am undone. Um, I, live upon, uh, I live among people that are sinful. I am sinful. And he felt like he wasn't worthy to get anywhere close to God. And that's the way we are by ourselves. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And because we're impure and because he's pure, even though he loves us deeply, his purity will not allow us to enter heaven. Secondly, the second issue with God is God has to be absolutely fair to everything he created. God has to be fair to himself. God has to adhere to the laws that he has set up to govern the universe. How many know God is even fair to his enemy? God has to even be fair to Satan. If God were to forgive us just because he loves us, Satan would have the right to wag his hand and finger in God's face and say, how can you forgive these people who have sinned? Their sin must be paid for. I was in heaven. Iniquity was found in me and I, had, I led an insurrection of angels against you and you kicked me out and you have consigned me one day to a place called the lake of fire. How can you let these people that you created in your image and in your likeness, how can you let them go? you didn't left me off the hook why didn't you just forgive me if you can forgive them then you know what you can forgive me and let me go free now couldn't he do that but no God's just and God is fair God's fair to himself fair to the laws he set up to govern the universe God's also fair to his enemy even Satan he's fair to and because of that uh, Psalm 89 14 says your kingdom is ruled by justice and fairness with love and faithfulness leading the way God in his love so think about what Satan did he's a sneaky rascal I mean, he actually had the idea that if he could sneak into the garden where he placed Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, and if he could get them to miss the mark and sin, if he could get them to rebel against God with the will that they gave him, then God would have, have no, other, no other course but to consign them, us, to hell just like he was consigned to hell. You got to understand, Satan has a chip on his shoulder, the Bible says, because of being kicked out of heaven. And when Satan was kicked out of heaven, he was kicked down to the earth. And when God created Adam, and when God created Eve, he, he was angry and upset because he saw God come down in the cool of the day and fellowship with him. And he was upset because of, of them having fellowship with God. And he was jealous and he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get in between them and God. I'm going, to, I'm going to cause them to do something that will cause them to have the same future that I have. They're going to burn in the lake of fire just like I do. There's one part of the equation, however, that Satan misunderstood. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says that if the, uh, the rulers, the demonic forces that control this world understood what, who Jesus is and what he would do when he died, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. So what did God do? And what did Satan misunderstand? He misunderstood how deeply, 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 deeply God loves us. It blows me away to think that God created me to love him. And because of the first man's sin, I inherit sin. And because of that inherited sin, and then because when I get to the age of accountability, I choose sin. My sin has to be paid for. 
Satan knew that. He knew that God, God was judicial. Our salvation is a legal document, guys. It could be held up in any court of law. And it'll be held up in the court of the universe as a document that absolutely guarantees freedom to every sinful human being who will embrace what Jesus Christ did on the cross. See, Satan misunderstood God's great love for us. He thought, well, if I can just get, if I can just get man to sin and do what I did, if I can just get him to rebel against God, they won't have a chance. And you know what? I can slap God's face every day. He, he made me leave heaven because I wanted to do it my way. And I wanted to usurp his throne. And you know what? He's created these people in his image. If I can just get them to slap God's face by saying, I want to do it my way too. I'm not going to listen to you. Then they'll get the judgment that I get. But he forgot that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the thing that he forgot. He had no idea that God loved us so much that he would assume the liability of our sin himself. He never could envision because he's corrupted. His wisdom is corrupted. He never could envision that God loved us so much that he himself would get into a human body and live what like we live and go through what we go through and never sin and then stand and be the payment for sin. He never understood the love of God. And y'all, if you understand that there's no way because of God's holiness, because of God's purity, and because of God's righteousness that you can ever, ever, ever go to heaven on your good works, you would bow your knee to Jesus today. We've got songs that have been sung through the history of the church about the great depths of the love of God. You don't understand the depth of God's love without understanding that without the love of God, we all perish in a place called the lake of fire. Isn't that something? Number three, Jesus became our sin so he could pay our sin penalty for us. Listen to the scriptures. I've got several translations here. For he had made him, this is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness is the ability to stand before God just as though you had never done wrong. No inferiority, no condemnation, just as though you had no past. That's righteousness. Righteousness is the ability to stand before God just the way Jesus Christ as the God-man stands before God. Absolutely clean. Absolutely pure. Never did anything wrong. When you come to Christ, God sees you, that you have no past. Is that awesome? So the New Living tra- uh, Translation says, 2 Corinthians five twenty one. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through him. He became the offering. I like the way it put it. Then the message paraphrase says this, in Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. Isn't that good? Then Philip's New Testament. This is a great Uh, translation for God caused Christ who himself knew nothing of sin actually to be sin for our sakes so that in Christ we might be made good with the goodness of God isn't that awesome so Jesus had no sin of himself but what did he do God had him assume our sin liability our sin obligation Isaiah 53 verse 6 All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. New Living Translation, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Now, when God laid our sin on Jesus, that means everything that, think about your own life. That's what I do. I personalize it. I go back to my life and I think of the things that I've done. I think about the disobedience 
that I portrayed to my parents. I think about the times that I cursed and used God's name. I think about the times that I gossiped and said surreal things about people that now I'm ashamed of. I think about the lust that has been in my life. I think about the lying. I think about the cheating. I think about the deceptive practices that I myself have been involved in. Jesus became that on the cross. Think about the thing that you're most ashamed of in your life. When Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible says he became what you were. He became the liability of your sin. He assumed the payment for our sin. Number four, Jesus went to hell in your place and totally paid your sin penalty. You don't hear this preached a lot, but the truth is Jesus took our sin liability, which means he has to pay exactly the price that we are required to pay for God to be fair and for God to be just to himself, to his own laws, and to his enemy. Those sins that we have committed and that sin debt must be played. And God chose to bring his son out of heaven, live a perfectly sinless life in a human body, and then God chose at the very end of Jesus' life to place our sin liability on him. That's awesome. And then when Jesus died on the cross, you remember, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus Some people think this is controversial. I think it's just simply scriptural. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die physically. Jesus took and assumed my and your spiritual death. Sin is deeper than the physical body. If Jesus' physical sufferings dealt with the sin problem, then all we need to do is suffer physically. And we can suffer for our own sins, right? Think about it. Think about how horrible it was, the beatings. And we've seen, you know, the passion of the Christ. And that was a very graphic movie and just terribly depictive of the terrible suffering that Jesus endured on the cross, as bad as that was. As bad as it was to suffer Roman crucifixion, which was barbaric. As bad as it was for nails to be be thrust into his wrists and into his feet. And to die by fixation. Jesus literally died of a broken heart. As bad as that was. Even deeper and even worse was that Jesus Christ, the spotless, sinless Son of God, who has existed through all eternity with God, allowed himself to be ostracized from his own Father. He assumed the obligation of our sin. He became sin. He died spiritually. That's a shock. It makes you think, doesn't it? And when Jesus died, my God, my God, Why have you forsaken me? And then when he died physically, Jesus didn't go to heaven. Jesus went to where we should go and he paid our sin debt in hell. Listen to Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. What is in the heart of the earth? Well, you get some idea if you go look at the news and look at what's happening in Hawaii right now. It's molten rock. It's lava. It's fire. It's hot. It's terrible. That's where the Bible says clearly that hell is. Listen to uh, Acts chapter 2 real quickly. Um, David said concerning him, I'm jumping right in the middle of this scripture, Acts 2.25, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, for David said concerning him, Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, he's at my right hand, that I may not be shaken, therefore my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad, moreover my flesh will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. Hades is the term for hell. When Jesus died, He went to hell for you and to me. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And then Romans chapter 10, 6 and 7. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Don't say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. That word abyss. 
The same word for hell. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Therefore, he says, the apostle Paul speaking to the believers in Ephesus when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what does it mean? But he first also descended into the lower parts of the earth. What is at the lower parts of the earth? The place called hell. Jesus went there for you and for me. Aren't you glad? Then 1 Peter chapter 3, for Christ also suffered once for sin, the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom he also went and preached, that is in the spirit, when Jesus died spiritually, and his spirit left his body. It says, by whom he also went and preached to the spirit's in prison, who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. It says, He went and preached to the spirits in prison. In 1 Peter 4 6, for this reason the gospel was preached to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. I've mentioned this in the past, but those Old Testament believers, they couldn't go immediately to heaven at death because their sin debt had not yet been legally paid. And God had to, had to find a place to put their departed spirits when they died. They couldn't go to heaven because of God's purity, because of God's holiness, but out of God's love, God carved a place out in the underworld. It was called paradise. It was called Abraham's bosom. And it was a place that was separated from the flames of hell that Noah and Abraham and Isaiah and Daniel and Moses and all of the patriarchs of old that we read about in the Old Testament. That's where they went when they died, awaiting one day the coming of the Messiah who would preach the gospel to them and he would say, you, you sacrificed a lamb and you believe the blood of that lamb would cleanse your sin once a year and that blood was put uh, uh, into the Holy of Holies on a place uh, where the presence of God was indicating there's coming a day that a real lamb, the lamb of God would take away your sin. He said, I'm the one, I'm the lamb, I'm the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the Bible says that Jesus preached the gospel to the saints in that righteous side of hell. Uh, but the thing that startles me and perhaps bothers me the most is that the scripture seems to indicate not Jesus not only preached the gospel in that righteous side of hell and then when Jesus was raised from the dead those Old Testament saints got out of there and, and they when the, Jesus resurrected from the dead they resurrected from the dead but the thing that shocks me most is that it looks as though Jesus went to the unrighteous side and he stayed there to pay the legitimate penalty for your sin and mine. We're supposed to go there. But Jesus went there for us. I want you to listen to Psalm 88. It is a, it's a description. Often when, uh, when uh, the prophets would write and the Holy Spirit would come upon the people that wrote the word of God, they would be talking about something current, but then they would also be talking about something that would be in the future. And this is an exact description of deity, suffering, for humanity in a place called hell. Listen to Psalm 88. O oh Lord, my God, O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I've cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those that go down to the pit. That's hell. I am like a man who has no strength, that's Jesus when he became our sin. Adrift among the dead like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more and who are cut off from your hand. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried on the cross. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. 
You have afflicted me with all of your waves. Wave after wave of the anger of God because of sin came upon the spotless Son of God who has made our sin in hell. Listen, you have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I'm shut up and I cannot get out. My eyes waste away because of affliction. Lord, I've called daily upon you. I've stretched out my hand to you. Will you work your wonders for the dead? And then you see, you see the, the characteristics of deity in hell. Listen to what he says. Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave. That's one of the attributes of God, loving kindness. Or your faithfulness in the place of destruction. That's another attribute of God. He is absolutely faithful. Then he says, shall your wonders be known in the dark? God's omnipotence, his all power, his wonders were found right there in the darkness of hell. And your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness, God's character is absolutely righteous. And it was found in the, in the darkness of hell when Jesus the Son went to pay our price for sin. Shall, and they, so he goes on to say, but to you I have cried out, O Lord. And in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day like water. They engulfed me altogether. Loved one and friend, you've put far from me and my acquaintance into darkness. Jesus stayed right there in the flames of hell until God was satisfied that everything that you and I have ever done that's called sin, that, that thing was completely paid for by Jesus Christ when he assumed our sin when he died spiritually in our place, when he went to hell and paid the payment that we should pay, and when God was satisfied that his sin debt was paid, Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus appeared to his disciples. He said, I'm he that, I'm he that was dead and I'm alive. Am I, I'm alive forevermore. And then he said, all authority is given unto me both in heaven and on earth. When Jesus died, another series I'll do really soon, when Jesus died, he not only took the obligations of our sin, he not only paid our sin debt for us, but he also took keys, the keys of hell and the keys of death. That is, Jesus took the authority that Adam and Eve had when God first created them. He took it away from Satan who got it when Adam and Eve obeyed him. Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. The authority that Adam and Eve gave away, the authority over hell, the authority over death, the authority over demonic forces, Jesus took back when he raised from the dead. And that means you and I are free from Satan's control. We can be free from sin. We can lay, live a life of purity. We can live a life of holiness. We can live a life of freedom. We can live a life that honors God. And one day, thank God, just like Jesus, when we die, we won't go to hell. We'll go to a place called heaven because our sin debt's already been paid. Stand up on your feet. I'm done. Is that good news or what? 